Welcome everybody to another episode of Chewing the Cud. This is a weekly live stream where we discuss things related and unrelated to regenerative agriculture. Um, the way these usually work is we'll start off with some brief introductions about who the heck we are and why we're doing this. Um, and then we usually have a topic for that for this week that we'll talk about for however long it takes, usually 20, 30 minutes, something like that. Um, and this week's topic is managing the spring flush, um, what that even means. And, um, and then after that is the part that we really enjoy, which is going into uh, the Q&A, ask us anything. You guys steer the stream from then on out. So just throw your comments and your questions in the chat and we'll do our best to answer everybody. I'm aware of the fact that there's probably gonna be a lot more people on than normal. Um, so we're gonna do our best to answer all the questions, but if, if, it's, if it's really crazy, we'll, we'll do our best. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we'll go as long as it's go as long as it's interesting, and um, yeah, why don't we just start off with some brief introductions. brief introductions? So everybody, my name is Isaac Tapman. This is Ben Holly. We're interns here at Green Pastures Farm with Greg Judy. Um, many of you know us from YouTube, from Greg's YouTube. Um, some of you know us from other places too, and um, we both have a deep passion for the land and for the animals and the care of the land, you know, and, and these regenerative practices that we're here learning at Green Pastures Farm. Here at the farm, we run 370 head of South Pole cattle, roughly 160 head of St. Croix sire hair sheep. We uh, raise shiitake mushrooms, we sell balan rollers, we host grazing schools, farm walks, we do consulting, all kinds of stuff. Yep. So we're, we're here to learn what we can um, from Greg and, and Jan and and enjoy the process along the way. So, yeah, glad you can join us. Join us on the journey. Yeah, it's exactly. been a good one. It's been good so far. It's gonna be. It's gonna be good in the future. Yeah, too, exactly. So. It's it's a good good spot to be in. So, um, I guess we'll we'll just jump into the topic for the week, which is. Sorry, we just ate really fast to make sure that make I got sure that my, we got my raw milk. Make sure that we did. We got here on time tonight. Um, so. Uh, yeah, well, I guess we'll just start off with with the topic for the week, which is uh, the spring flush. And so why don't we just start off super basic for people who aren't super familiar with, you know, grazing terminology. What what even is the spring flush and, and why should we care about it in the first place? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You want to? Sure. So, yeah. Go do What's the spring basics? flush? Um, when, we re when we reference the spring flush, we're talking about the span of two to three months from when the grass starts growing to when it starts to go into the summer slump when you know temperatures start to get real hot it starts to get dry and the grass growth shuts off so in that period of from from here in, in here in rucker missouri it's april 7th to 11th is when we usually start growing grass through i don't know maybe july 1st it depends roughly. it depends on the year yeah that's yeah. that's like kind of the window we're talking about when we're talking spring flush and what happens is the grass has a tremendous growth there's like crazy amount of biomass that's that's uh, grown and you know exploded i think it's like the most grass in, in like any time period is going to be grown in the spring flush compared to the rest of the year yeah. so like it's really important um to manage through correctly because it really has an impact on you know the rest of your year both in the growing season and in the in the non-growing season so yeah. And it has an it has a a, a a large a disproportionate impact on your animal's health as well. Yep. So um, there's we'll get we'll get into all that. Um, but I guess like the question is right like what? Okay, so the grass starts growing right in the spring, but like when, like when is it safe to graze? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because there's there's a point in which like you can you can jump the gun and you can be too early on mm -hmm. that spring flush. And, and that's going to like, you know, hurt you for a whole variety of reasons further on down the road. But, um, I think what you really need to be concerned about is, is just looking at the height of your grass and looking at the temperatures you've got going forward for the next like week or two and what the weather's sort of looking like. And if it looks like, yep, we're going to get some warm temps, the grass is, is definitely growing. And once you get that grass up to, I don't know, like the taller, the better, right? But and so it's this delicate balance of if you're managing your stockpile at the at the end of the winter, it's trying to sort of still have some stockpile forage left in the spring. In the spring the when like growing. the grass starts growing, so you can buy time for let that to let that grass get up. I don't know six eight inches inches yeah. minimum 
um, and then and then start grazing it. Don't start grazing it when you see tiny two, little two inches of grass. Two inches of grass, because you you hit that, and then you're gonna be setting those plants back significantly um, for that big jump that you were just talking about um, for the mm -hmm. spring, which then sets them up well for the rest of the year. Another advantage to having the stockpile left over is. When you've got stockpiled in the spring flush, that new tender grass that's growing up is really high in protein, but not high in a lot of energy or like, like you know, carbs, carbohydrates. Yeah. And so having that leftover stockpile residual, you know, grass, fe stockpiled fescue, when they're reaching down there getting that tender, delicious spring green grass, yep. they can't help but grab a couple, you know, a couple blades of the dry last year's forage. And so it kind of helps balance out their rumen and their you know, their nu nutrition requirements. Cause what will yeah. happen in the springtime yeah. is super common is since it's like the grass is such a high in protein, they're getting just protein, 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 way too much protein. And their, their manure becomes really runny and they, they can actually lose weight. Yep. You know, it's the best growing time, it's, time of the year so to grow strange. grass and they'll lose weight because they have too much protein, protein and not enough energy. So, yeah. And so like if you if you are if you've set it up where you grazed all of your stockpile off and then you perfectly timed it with the start of the spring flush, that's totally fine. But what we'll do if we're in areas where we either graze the stockpile a little bit lower or there's just not any like available because we took it over the course of the winter in that like super high growth period during that spring flush, we'll actually unroll a partial bale um, yeah. for the mob. And, and it, what's funny is like they'll actually, even though they have so much grass, they sort of understand like, oh, my stomach kind of hurts. Like, and they go over and take a, a couple bites of that dry hay and it definitely sort of helps settle things down. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not just animal performance. So you actually can, can, can run into some serious health complications with, with grazing the spring flush. Um, one thing is you really, it's really a good time to make sure that your animals are getting a adequate amount of mab manganese. Manganese. Or um, it's not magnesium. Is it magnesium? I don't know. It's, it's MG uh, in our, in our mineral feeder. Um, I think it's manganese. That's yeah. what Greg says. Yeah. It's either manganese or magnesium. But mag, like, so you can buy like a high mag mineral, mm -hmm. um, which is a mix of, it, it's like a, if you don't do free choice enterprise stuff. Um, you can, you can just buy like a bag of this, I think it's called high mag where it's, it's mm -hmm. actually a mix of other, of other, you know, minerals in there, but there's a high level of, of, of that manganese, magnesium. There are two different elements I understand, but it's, I don't want to say the wrong thing. So it's one of the two. It's one of the two. Um, and anyway, so it just makes sure that you get that in the animals because they can actually die. Um, mm -hmm. if they, if they don't get an adequate amount of that, because what happens is the, is because the grass is growing so quickly, there's a high protein content and there's also a high like water content in the grass. Like there's really very little mineral value. Um, it's magnesium. Magnesium. There's really very little mineral value in the in the forage itself. And so you really just gotta be making sure that you've got that mineral and that salt and that magnesium available um, to those animals because they're not gonna be getting it from the grass in that period of time. As the grass starts to slow down um, growth, and they get, there's more like phytochemicals and like secondary metabolites and stuff like accumulating in the plant. Then you, that's when like all those minerals are there for the taking um, and you run it and you don't have that issue anymore um, of that, what you would call, some people call like washy grass um, in the, in mm -hmm. the, in the springtime. So, so how do we manage our grazing? Like what, what's our paddock size? How, how fast are we moving them? In yeah. The flush? That's kind of an important one. It, yeah. That's super important. So it's like, the rule of thumb you have to remember is you need to match the speed of your grass growth. So if the grass is growing really quickly, you need to be moving your animals really quickly. If the grass is growing really slowly, you need to be moving your animals really slowly. And so that being said, the grass is growing the fastest in the spring. And so we make sure that we give the animals the biggest paddocks that we give them over the course of the entire year, which means that we end up making the fastest rotation around the farm. We make about depending on the year, like, like five, five, six rotations, like, yeah. like in total, yeah. like around the farm. And that, that rotation in the spring, it's like 30 days. Yeah. 30 days. The fastest I think Greg's ever done it it's is 28, 28 days. days. Um, and the average I would say is like 60 days. That's like a, yeah. like middle of the road in the winter. We're like 90 plus in the, in, in drought periods, it could go even more, but, um, that spring flush is like 30 days. Um, 
it's, it's pretty nuts how fast we get around the farm. But it's because the reason you want to be moving quickly and matching the growth of the speed, uh, the matching the speed of the growth of the plant is because, okay, okay. Keep, keep going. Right I saw back. that. Um, the reason you want to match the speed of the growth of your, of, of your plants is because if you, if you move your animals too slowly, the plants are going to end up putting a seed head on too quickly. And so what you're essentially trying to avoid as a, as a grass, as a manager of grass, as a grazer, is is you're you're trying to avoid that seed head because once the plant puts the seed head on, that's it's it's fulfilled its accomplishment in life because it's now able to reproduce. And so once that happens, the grass becomes incredibly woody or lignified in the nutritional, the plane of nutrition or the the, the feed value of that seed head grass like plummets. And so to avoid the grass putting on a seed head too quickly, you have to match that speed of the spring flush because it's cranking. If you don't like catch up with that, with that growth, like a huge chunk of your farm is going to go, it's going to go into seed. And when that happens, you sort of screwed yourself for the, the latter part of the summer because now you're battling all of this like super woody stuff and you're sort of relying on regrowth in order to find some sort of palatability. Um, and we can talk about different ways of, of, like of handling like the seed head problem you know what i mean because yeah. it's something that the reason you move them super fast is to try to avoid it but sometimes like if you've got perfect growing conditions and the grass is absolutely cranking you just can't move them fast enough you can't give them big enough areas you just don't have enough animals to keep up with it you have the appropriate you're appropriately stocked and if you want to learn about stocking density <laughs> and stuff like that go the watch next. the last week's episode because that's what we talked about but anyway if you're appropriately stocked for the, the majority of the year, most likely you're gonna be understocked for the amount of grass you grow in the spring flush. And so there's a couple different techniques that you can implement to try to like m avoid or mitigate the production of seed heads and maintain the nu nutrition, the nutritive quality of your, of your forage. Um, so, we could talk about, I don't, we've got yeah. a lot of questions. You want to just you dive into just, the questions? Let's just you? finish the thought though. Let's the, finish the, the like, like, hogging or well, or? yeah. So like one option is, is you could clip parts of your pasture that are getting away from you. Mm -hmm. So you, you pull your brush hog up really high. So you're just taking off mm -hmm. the seed heads basically, or the tops of those plants that are about to go to seed. Um, and that will knock it back and then it and then it, it becomes more palatable but the thing you have to be careful of you is you never want to do that in front of your animals so wait for your animals to go through they're not going to eat it all because you're giving them that huge paddock remember they're not going to eat all of the all the forage mm -hmm. there's going to be a ton left standing and you come in right behind them to maximize the recovery time after that clipping you come in right behind them and you just knock the tops of the seed heads off with your brush hog that's one option Another option is you I like this one. Yeah, okay. yeah. So this, this like this is another option that, that might work for your situation or whatever, is you want to so basically like say you're 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 rocking around your farm, right? You're going as fast as you possibly can, and you go and check your paddocks that are two, three weeks away, right, from mm -hmm. where you're gonna be. And you go and look and you're like Or like the paddock where you started. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, where the beginning, yeah, where you started, let's started say. Like grazing. that first that first paddock that you grazed, right? If you go and look at that and you still have like two or three weeks left in your rotation or whatever, before and, you, get are, and before you get to that paddock and it's already putting on seed heads, there's no way that you can speed it up. What you might want to do is just like not graze that paddock, like just skip, skip the paddock and like push them ahead. And what's going to happen is like that, that, that grass is going to put on seed heads and it's going to become lignified. But essentially what you're doing is you're sacrificing that area in order to maintain palatability over the rest of your farm and then maybe if you get into a drought right like mm -hmm. you know part way through that summer slump you're gonna have a ton of grass still available it may be woody and lignified but the at least it's grass yeah it's grass and the feed value of that is going to be better than any hay that you can buy so you sort of save your you sort of reserve that woody lignified stuff and then you and you skip it, so yeah, and then you, you just, come back around. You start like you started grazing. Yep. You, you're almost through the end of your rotation, but you still got this chunk left. But you need to be here. This is what like this is like ideal grazing 
expect to start. Yeah. You just go to there. Skip you it. Just leave this for yeah, like you said, later in the summer. Later in the summer. When and it's allowing it to allow it to go to seed and get really woody, but it will <clears> it would <throat> save your bacon if mm. if you get into a drought because you have yep. all of this standing forage that you didn't even touch. And it's gonna be better for your animals because they have maximum you know, you're able to keep the forage at the palatability that that's like you know perfect for their nutrition requirements like they're not they're not eating too woody of yep. of grass and they're not eating too yep tender of grass it's like just just right so, yep exactly yeah. and if you're in an area that has a lot of um fescue like kentucky 31 fescue the other problem with the seed head thing is that the endophyte right the toxic endophyte concentrates in that seed head so if your animals are eating a lot of seed heads because you let it go to seed you're going to see a lot more fescue toxicity in your animals so it's a, just another layer of you really got to try to avoid putting on those seed heads and we i mean we had areas of the farm because we had a crazy spring last year yeah we had areas of the farm that fully went to seed yeah and you just sort of give them big areas and you graze through it um and that regrowth that comes back up is just nuts because mm -hmm. it's insulated almost from like the elements by all that woody dead standing stuff. You just get incredible biomass in that regrowth, mm -hmm. um, which is which is super cool to see. Um, yeah, but it's getting me excited for spring. I know it's getting me excited <laughs> for spring too. We can see the grass growing. Yeah, it's happening. We're getting a lot of rain right now. I don't know if you can hear it outside, but we needed it pretty badly, and that's gonna just it's gonna. Gonna cause a jump. We're gonna get some cool temps next week though, so we get a little ways, a little ways off. Little ways. It's still early. We're still in March. Mm -hmm. All right. That was a little, that was probably the shortest, the shortest like speed run. Oh no, no, it was it was pretty good. It was about it was fifteen it? minutes. Oh yeah, man. Usually you go for like twenty thirty, but <laughs> yeah. the but like if you say there's a bunch of questions, there's like a, there's let's, a few questions. We can prioritize some of that, and then and uh, I'm sure people might have already answered some keep, of them. Keep 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 cranking with them, but um. That's in a nutshell, that's like what you need to be. So to recap, let's do that. To, to recap, recap, right? Spring flush is when that grass is growing faster than it ever will in the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. You may need to make sure you don't get out on it too early. You need to make sure that you're supplementing your cattle with a little bit of dry material, whether that's hay or hay stockpile. Or stockpile. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure you're getting magnesium and adequate mineral because that grass is super washy, right? You need to be giving them huge areas so that you're moving across your farm and matching that really fast growth speed and you're trying to avoid seed head production. And so if it gets away from you, skip it or brush hog it to main, to either to maintain the high plane of nutrition in your animal's diets. And either if you brush hog it, it'll grow back, brush hog it behind your animals, it'll grow back really palatable. If you don't brush hog it and skip it, you're gonna have a lot of like summer stockpile almost that you can use in the case of a drought. Mm -hmm. So that's like the speed run, how to manage during during the spring flush, um, if people have got, I'm sure there's questions, yeah, if people have questions there's or comments about questions. it, just fire it away. And it doesn't necessarily have to be related to the spring flush at no, all. You could ask anything. us like what, what we ate for dinner in like 15 minutes before we did this, or you know, what, what happened on the farm today or whatever, you know what I mean? It can be anything. Yeah. All right, let's start on these questions. Um, a lot of hellos. Yeah, hello to everybody out there, especially if you're a first time watcher. Yep. Someone said, found, found you guys through Greg's mention on YouTube, watched a lot of your videos, enjoyed your content. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Um, let's see. Loving, love watching Greg do his videos and featuring you guys. Yep. Keto for cows when we were talking about the high protein. Yeah. <laughs> That's yep. kind of what it's, it is. It's not good for them, though. You, no. They need carbohydrate um, All right. in order to maintain a, a good plan of nutrition and to not lose weight. Yeah. Yep. The Maple Valley Ranch. Do you do you clip all pastures behind the herd in spring flush to keep it from over maturing? So, like we talked about that a little bit, um, but th something to also that you have to balance is that the spring flush, at least here in Missouri, yeah. in most places, is the also the wettest time of your year, which is why, or at least just before the spring flush, is the wettest time of your year, um, which makes the pasture super soft. And so driving a heavy equipment like a tractor to go brush hog out on a pasture when it's super soft is not a good idea because you're gonna be leaving ruts. So that's a problem that we ran into last last summer is that we cranked with the forage, but then we weren't able to clip it until late in the summer because it was just so wet and moist in the first part of the year, perfect grass growing conditions, but it was too soft. Like it, the ideal time period for us to brush hog, we couldn't do it because mm -hmm. it was too soft. So we got a lot of seed heads and we sort of just grazed through it. And then Greg clipped 
maybe a little bit too late in certain areas, but I mean, he's just trying to, there's a bunch of motivations for clipping. It's not necessarily exclusively cattle nutrition yeah. and the seed heads. There's also like a, you need to make sure your landowners are happy. And if you have a lot of like, you know, people who live in town that own land, they really like it looking nice and pristine. And so there's mm -hmm. some value in doing that. Um, also for thorn tree maintenance thorn tree or any kind of brush one. maintenance. Yeah. Brush um, hogging. The is, brush hog is a lot more efficient yep. or a lot more yeah, convenient, efficient, to, convenient to, yeah. to, to knock those trees down than doing it by hand. But yeah. But the short answer is, yeah, we did work when we could. It just, you don't want to be you leaving don't, ruts. Yeah. And if you're, yeah. And the brush hogging is always a gamble. Yeah. Like in any situation when you're going to use it, if you're going to clip a large section of your pasture, if you end up getting into a drought and you brush hogged it, you're going to wish you hadn't because all of that material that was standing would still have feed value if it doesn't end up regrowing. Um, so even if it's a really wet year, like there's always some element of risk that if you don't get that regrowth, you might be shooting yourself in the foot, especially if you anticipate there being a dry time, don't brush hog behind your animals. Mm -hmm. Like let that, that residual still stand there because there will be some feed value left in it on the next. Another thing too, around. you got to think about, and, and we're not telling you to get, you know, all focused on, oh, I need to brush hog to maintain yep. animal health because it is a cost, you know, it's a, it's an expense. Yep. It's like what, I think Greg kept that out, it's like $3 an acre for him to brush hog, you know, like that's his cost per acre to do it. Or maybe it wasn't Greg, maybe it was someone Somebody else. Somebody else was, I think maybe um, Greg Brand was maybe, talking about it. Um, it's like um, $3 an acre, whatever it comes out to be for your situation, that's still a cost. And so, um, if your margins are small or you're just starting out, you know, then it's not going to be, Greg went without a tractor for 15, what, 15 years. 15 years. So it's yeah. not like something that's absolutely necessary, but it does, there is instances where it can help. So. Yeah, for sure. Just concentrate on moving them quick. And if you don't have a brush hog, try to move them as fast as you can. Maybe do a little skipping like we talked about. Yeah. And you'd be surprised at what kind of regrowth happens in an area that looks like completely woody and lignified. I was mm -hmm. super shocked. Mm -hmm. Like the North place got super Which, yeah. away, mature and away from us. And it, the places we didn't brush hog on there had some amazing regrowth. Mm -hmm. But another thing too, is we live in, we get 40 inches of rain here a yeah. year too. Like in yeah. other places, it, you, it just depends on your situation. That's, that's a common theme with this whole show is like <laughs> everything that we say is, has an asterisk being it depends on your situation yeah the, yep. the more the closer you are to what what greg what greg's operation is like here in central missouri the closer you are in climate to where we are the more applicable all this advice is going to be but like the farther away you are the more you're going to have to like just take what what what, what people we're saying is like oh we do this and think about how it applies to your situation because mm -hmm. there might be a way better way of doing something if you live in New Mexico or you live in Saskatchewan, you know? Yeah. So Florida. Or, yeah. Or Florida or the mountain West or, you know, mountain I mean? East. Like yeah. Even like, even York. like, yeah. New upstate, New, upstate York. New York, like similar, but different, you know? Yeah. All right. Another question. Um, is there a point in time that you are feeding mainly hay because there's no more grass growth? That's a good question. That's a good question. No, there's, so what we what we try to do during the winter time is we've got all the hay placed around the farm kind of spread out you know like 70 bales here 100 bales here 100 bales here like at different farms and so as the winter is going along we basically so like it was like november or something we made our first pass around the farm grazing as quick as we could just tipping it kind of like we do in the spring flush it's a similar speed yeah and then that second rotation we slowed them down real you know, we've slowed them back a lot, made them take it down to two inches, you know, the, the grass down. And then a lot of times we, you know, graze in the morning, feed hay in the, in the evening as the evening move or whatever. And so through the winter doing that, you know, day after day after day, we've been able to buy enough time now that we've still got stockpile ahead of us. You know, we've got, I don't know, hopefully we can make it last until the grass really starts growing. That's, that's our goal. I mean, we have a lot of hay, so we might have to slow them up and start feeding a little more hay. But as far as like going on full feed hay, you know, running out completely out of stockpile, that's kind of what you want to try to avoid and try to like manage, like to keep away from, especially 
in the in March Mud Month, which here in Missouri, that's March Mud Month is what like Greg refers to. Maybe it's different. It's probably way different in Saskatchewan yeah. and way different in, you know, down in like Mississippi. Um, but having that stockpile saved for like times like this where you can just go out and you can move the cattle you don't have to feed hay if it's like super muddy like it's raining right now yep it's just such you know such it just advantage. saves it just pays dividends in the long run so. and over the course of the winter if the cattle are getting a strip of stockpile minimum in mm -hmm. addition to whatever hay ration you're giving them even if it's not much like not enough for them to like really just a little bit of supplementation of stockpile with a big dose of hay the cattle are just so much happier, like mm -hmm. morale wise. You can tell, like they love it when we get to unroll a wire, even if there's not a lot of feed in there. They just feel better knowing that, like, they got to move and try to like run around and pick out something to eat, and then also eat hay. So, like, as far as the well being of the cattle, they seem to do a lot better if you're able to always give them a little bit of stockpile with everything. Like the goal is to never completely run out of stockpile because we were talking about it. It comes in handy in the spring mm -hmm. with that dead standing stockpile and that new spring grass to be able to graze both at the same time mm -hmm. um so to buy time yeah like you were saying we feed and but then again like when we have this you know polar vortex negative 25 degree temps like you know nine inches of snow on the ground we were we were on full full feed full hay feed for probably, for probably three, four three or four days so it's condition dependent you mm -hmm. know like sometimes you got the stockpile but you just can't access it because mm -hmm. there's ice or snow or um or whatever you know or maybe you need to move into the next area but you just got a ton of rain and it's a bunch of bottom ground and so it's super muddy and you don't want to go down in there and destroy it stop all the so you the so you, so you buy some time by going full feed up on a hill to like you know let that dry out and then once it's dry enough to go down there and take advantage of it then you go back down and resume grazing stockpile so mm -hmm. it's like it's a it's a balance and, and you learn how to manage that just through experience and um, knowing yeah. your herd, knowing how much they like to eat. Um, anyway, we can get into a whole discussion about how yeah. to calculate like, and then there's like the whole thing of, well, shouldn't you be, you, you shouldn't be feeding any hay. You should just great. You could just graze all through the winter. In and, theory, and you could, you could, but it's the time just like, like you said, you yep. get nine inches of snow. You can't like, at least Greg's cattle, they can't graze through that. And so they're not designed for it. having that hay. They're not designed or trained and having yeah. that hay, you know, it's just completely necessary. Um, yeah. This is just an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. And some years he feeds very little and some years he feeds a lot. This year we fed a lot because we're growing the herd as well. So yeah. he wintered more animals this year than we ever have. Um, mm -hmm. So for like a maintenance herd, you know, if you're keeping it at a, at a threshold, Greg likes to consider, or, and this is just obviously situation dependent. <laughs> yeah. Greg factors about one bale per winter per head is like that's what he wants to feed through the winter um so and that like you know throughout the winter he's we're feeding three bales in the morning three bales at night six for bales a, a day feed. for full feed but throughout the winter i'll say as 370 head he wants to feed close to 370 bales to over his, the course of the winter over the course of the and winter. the way you calculate it out is, it, is it's three percent of the animal's body weight in feed every day is needed for just maintenance mm -hmm. so if you do the math Thousand, thousand pound, pound cow, three percent body weight is thirty pounds. thirty pounds. They need thirty pounds of hay a day. How much does your round bale weigh? Twelve hundred pounds. Twelve hundred pound round right, bale. But you want twenty percent residual, so, so eighty percent of that. Eighty percent of twelve twelve hundred, which is, which like is over, uh, uh, anyway. over eight hundred and then pounds. Eight hundred pounds. So then you multiply that out, and you need about for three hundred seventy head, three percent. You need about six bales. It's six yeah, or seven you, bales, you but you got to do the math. But the the thing to remember is you need three percent body weight every day just for maintenance and so mm -hmm. know the way to your bales know the way to your cows and you can do the math and figure that out mm -hmm. how long your winter is how much hay you're roughly going to be able to feed that's sort of how greg comes out to one bale per head for the duration of the winter 370 mm -hmm. head 370 bales mm -hmm. get fed and obviously he he would like, like to finish the winter with 100 bales left over mm -hmm. is what is is his ideal just because that's like it's just like almost having money in the bank. Yeah. It's like an insurance policy. If like, you start like whittling it down and you're down to five, six bales or whatever, like you're sort of sweating when you get down to that because mm -hmm. there's a situation where maybe there's a, the spring flush is late and 
like you're going to be screwed. So mm -hmm. be scrambling to try to buy some hay off of somebody, which is never a good thing. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it's just experience getting, getting used to it. And we're by all means, not experts at it at all. It's just what we've done so far this winter. And we've talked to Greg about this a lot because it's a really important, <laughs> it is. It is. important thing to manage. And, and it re requires a lot of planning and forethought way back when in, in the summer, when you should be purchasing your hay to like figure out how much you need and you know, like that whole deal. So yeah. Yep. Um, do we bring in additional animals in the spring to keep up with the grass through that's custom good. grazing or otherwise? Good question. That's a really good question. It would be awesome if you like, that's another solution is like, if you have a way of magically getting, getting bringing animals on in and April offloading them and getting rid of them in July, in July once the grass slows down. If you could do that, that would be awesome if you had a situation where you could do that. We, Greg, the, Greg's just not set up the, to do Well, it. the problem is with custom grazing, you know, if someone brings you their cows in April, they expect you to keep them through the rest of the season. You know, yeah. they're not going to want to come pick them up in July because their grass isn't growing either, you know, yeah. compared to the same as yours. So yeah. it's like... It's hard. Like, yeah, it's, you know, the spring flush is growing best for them, so they, they don't care having their cows there at their place. So Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Yeah. There, there is a there situation. There might be a way though, you could do it. If so, like it, maybe if you were linked up with like a grass finisher, right? Yeah. And you and and he and he or she bought like stockers for you to like to graze to and finish. Fat, even, to, maybe. Yeah, like or even finishers like yeah. for like over that spring, and then and you only need them for that period of time to just pack on the pounds during that spring flush, which you have to be careful of because of what we talked about earlier with the washy grass and making mm -hmm. sure they get enough carbohydrate. But anyway pack on the pounds during the spring and then either ship them off to somebody who's going to finish them or they're you finish them and now you're shipping them off to somebody to to slaughter them or whatever like that's that might be a situation where you'd be able to pull it off but in general you're right like if yeah. people are custom grazing they want you to have the animals for the duration of the growing season usually so it doesn't really mm -hmm. work that way but um i don't know everyone's situation is different if you got a, a, a hookup where you could do that it's a huge it be, advantage. It's a huge advantage. Um, yeah. Oh, man. If, you could, if we could double our herd in the spring. We, we need like 700 animals usually mm -hmm. is what like in the spring. And then we need to get rid of them. Because we <laughs> don't need 700 like animals like the rest of the year. The rest of the year. But, yeah. Yeah. All right. That was a good question. Yep. Could you make hay out of it instead of sacrificing skipping it? Um, wait. He's talking about yep. the, the when, when you're skipping. Yep. There are people that, you know, we'll do that's that. what they'll do. They'll reserve that. And then I think Joel Salatin does that. You know, once he once he gets to the time he needs to be, he just skips it. And then he'll make that into hay and then pick it back up in a later rotation. We, we are kind of along the lines of, so we could get into this whole discussion yeah. too. It, we've, we've talked about it in, in previous, episodes. previous episodes. But every bay or... Uh, how do we put it that way? So yeah. every bale has roughly what is it thirty pound, thirty dollars worth of like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, like nutrients, you know, from from the land yeah. or whatever. Um, and when you you know roll it up in a round bale, you haul it off. Even if you feed it right back on that spot, you're only gonna go only going to replenish re replenish eighty percent of what you took off, and so. And and that's yes. that's factoring yeah. in if you you feed it right back out onto the land. If you bale hay and you take that hay off and you sell it, or you feed it somewhere else, or feed farm. it somewhere else, and you don't put any kind of fertilizer, fertilizer or compost or, or any some kind of, something back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it's gonna take five years for that piece of land that you took hay off of to come full circle back to the place it used to be. So I'm not I'm not trying to I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just, you know, putting that out there. And there's a there's like a whole host of advantages of like what like we were talking about earlier. If you get into a drought, it's better to have that mm -hmm. than to have failed it for hay because the, it's like you're preserving the you're preserving like the grass sort of like balance in mm -hmm. ecosystem that's existing from soil like up through that stand of grass. If you leave it out there, if you cut it off, you're completely upending that whole deal and mm -hmm. it just takes it takes time for that to recover. Um so, yeah, the that's sort of like the short answer as to even why we don't bale hay at all. Um, if it's there are certain systems like let's yeah. say you're trying to do an organic you know operation. We were yep. talking about this organic operation. You need 
organic, organic hay. hay and nobody yeah. around you like you'd have to pay an arm and a leg just to yeah. get you know a couple of bales maybe that's a situation where you bale it you store it up on pole you know on yeah. logs right in the same field and you feed it right back out on the same land that you took it from yeah you might be losing whatever 20 percent of the nutrients but at least yeah you know you're not setting yourself way back and you're able to keep that organic yeah you know certified and everything that's on your farm so just it's, it's situation not, yeah it's not yeah. not like we're saying don't do it, it. it's like just be aware be careful so. of, of of bailing your own hay mm-hmm. that's that's and that's if people are interested in that like there's a lot more to that discussion as well mm-hmm. so it just fired away and maybe we'll cover it in this one if we can get to, if we can get to the get end to them. <laughs> all right uh here y'all use the term civil pasture a lot what does that exactly mean that's a good question civil pasture like silvo is like related to trees so like civil civil culture is like trees being used in an agriculture standpoint civil pasture is s i l v o pasture yeah. is is what you think trees and pasture like existing in the same mm-hmm. entity and so what you do is you reduce the you thin the stems per acre as far as like the density of your tree stand down to a level that you can grow adequate amount of grass below it mm-hmm. and you then can run your cattle th- your cattle you can run your <laughs> your cattle through the trees yeah um and you and get gain, uh, gain some feed value. you get you gain feed value but also you're preserving the high quality timber species in mm-hmm. that in that stand of trees which then because they're released from all the um light competition from their like neighboring scrub trees they'll explode and put on more board feet and also improves like the quality of your timber stand so as long as you make sure that your animals are moving fast enough through that timber and they're not mm-hmm. hanging out in the civil pasture area because cattle will are hard on trees if they're there for any length of time mm-hmm. so if you keep them moving and you've got adequate grass, you get shade, sometimes you get feed value if there's, if there's like acorns or if there's um, honey locust seed pods or mm-hmm. like, you know, persimmons or apples all or kinds like stuff. all kinds of stuff that the cattle could also eat. Um, it's like a win-win. It's the only thing I'll say about civil pasture though is it is work. It takes, it's a lot of it's labor. It's a lot to get of to labor it. to get it to and get time. it up and running. And it, I think the reason I say that is because it's something that is sort of popular in the regenerative space where people will be like, oh, like got all this woods, I'm gonna turn it into a civil pasture. And it's like, you could, but it's gonna long. take a lot more effort and a lot longer than you think it's going to. Mm-hmm. That's not saying that you can't do it. It's just, you gotta be aware of the fact that- for Yeah, for situations yeah. like, there's a few different spots around the farm that have silvo pasture, and they're super cool. I, I love the silvo yeah, pasture. Yeah, it's an it's awesome a, ecosystem. You know, it's it's yeah. like a multi-tiered production system. Um, I think where it really excels is on in the small scale space where yep. say someone has 40 acres and they have this, you know, 10 acre lot of trees and they, they're running whatever, 20 cows or however many they're running sheep, sheep maybe. Yeah. And they're like, Oh man, I could, I could really get some use out of that. And 10 acres is a lot easier to clear than 200 acres. <laughs> you yeah. know, like it takes, it'll take effort, but it's a lot more doable. It's not as big of a mountain to tackle. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's where it's like, you know, super, a huge advantage. Plus it's like with a smaller scale, you can take more care yep. like directly for that, that spot because, you know, you have less to do. So you can put more attention towards it and more effort. And so you, you end up with a better product product in the end. Yep. And so like in our situation, there's like, what, like. 600 acres of woods that we could turn to civil pasture. Well, like, just put it this way. The whole, all the leased farms here is 1,640 acres, and there's about 750 grazable yeah, acres. Yeah, so it's about... The rest of that is woods. So 900. Yeah. 900 acres of, of timber. Of timber. It's like, oh, there's so much... All parts of the farm. There's so much grazable acreage. It's like, yeah, but it would take you, like, 40 years to, like, yeah. turn it all to civil pasture, you know? Yeah. Um, and there are tools that make that faster. Like, like there are, like, machines that you can use that'll, like, chip trees just Mm -hmm. right on the spot where just like grabs it cuts it off turns it into wood chips and spits it out the other end you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff you could really make some make some progress with civil pasture but it's expensive and you can't be as selective almost as like and you're you're not care you're not getting like the value out of that timber that waste timber like maybe you could use it for firewood or something like that's where the smaller scale again yep you know, the advantages, there's advantages of small scale as well as, I mean, all people are always like, oh, like, 
bigger scale always has an advantage, and it's like not necessarily mm -hmm. certain things you can do a lot better on a smaller scale than you can at a larger scale, and a lot of things you can do better on a larger scale than you can at a smaller scale. So it's like you a know, balance. You gotta there take advantage that. of your of, of your leverage that you've got in your mm -hmm. given situation. Mm -hmm. um, That's yeah. a good question, though. Yep. All right. How is the management of the spring flush different with sheep? Um, it's pretty similar. Yeah, it's 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 we, basically the same. Yeah, it's pretty much the same. Um, if if, and this is another t topic we could get into, but ideally, if all our farms were contiguous or you know connecting, we would just run the sheep in with the cattle, you know, and we'd have a flurd, and so it'd be one herd moving around, you know, and, and we'd be doing the rotation that way, and then. You know, it'd, it'd be the same management. Yep. Um, since we can't do that because of the, like, you know, neighborhood dogs and long cattle drives and stuff like that, because we have guardian dogs in with the sheep, we have to rotate the sheep on their spot of the farm, and we'll bring the cattle through, but then we like make their way around the whole rest of the farm. So. Yep. But managing during the spring flush with sheep is the same principles. Mm -hmm. Um. They'll still get running manure from yep. high protein. They'll yep. still. You know, take it down too short if you leave them there a little too long. I mean, yeah. The see. only thing is, it's it's a little more difficult in general to get sheep to eat hay. So yeah, it's just something to think about. It's where the having the stockpile definitely helps. Yeah. Um, All right. Do any resources exist to connect landowners with the regenerative minded farmers looking to lease? Ooh, that'd be interesting. I don't know of any. That's a good idea, though. Someone should yeah. come up with something like that. That would be cool. Like a like, like almost like a form of social media. So you could like plug in your address and like anybody in the, your radius however who's looking is. for regenerative regeneratively minded people for leases mm -hmm. that would be so cool that would be awesome i gotta put that one in my back pocket that's yeah. someone's gonna come up with that before yeah too long. before too long whoever that is, that you, is better, you better start Fre patting freeman that brian or something. freeman Bri brian freeman you had a good good answer or a good question there yeah figure that out because that, yeah. i think that has some that, huge potential. that might be yeah that yeah. might be something that yeah then it has some serious yeah headwear you know yeah all right are there are there going to be more ponds developed this year <laughs> how many ponds did we build last year 19 night we built 19 new ponds last fall in the fall of last year are, no we already we finished the last i year. don't think we're building any more ponds <laughs> for a little while at least yeah. there's some areas that we're going to use the the bulldozer to like clear like some some woods areas that are we're reclaiming silver back, pasture. either civil pasture or straight pasture mm -hmm. um and yeah but that's about it as far as the like big heavy equipment like you yeah know. there's a lot of ponds we made this year and so there's almost a pond in every paddock at this point which is pretty nuts mm -hmm. um i mean not not actually but it's yeah, pretty I darn probably, close i could probably think of 10 paddocks that don't and there's what 61 60 66 paddocks or 66 something like that. paddocks yeah, yeah. So and by paddocks, and some of them, some of the paddocks have three, four ponds, depending on the yeah, size. But. Yeah. And by paddocks, it's it's not permanent paddocks. It's just areas yeah. that we then use our temporary wires to like divide into even smaller areas. So yeah. just to make that clear for everyone, we don't have permanent paddocks. <laughs> well, we kind of do. no, we do, but like we, don't, like we don't have sixty six. No, well, yeah, I we guess. Do. Yeah, but some of those don't have no, some of those don't have fences between right, them. You yeah. know what I mean? Like it's just there's an imaginary designation between like J eight and J nine. You know? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, that's true. I forgot about that. All right. Oh, I already answered that. All right. So some of them are you, permanent, but yeah. Do you guys cook your own meals after a long day? Yep. Yeah, we do. We cook everything. I mean, Jan's with Greg and I was down for dinner. Which is um, super every once in a while, which is much appreciated, but um, yeah, we're OYO um, as far as dinners are concerned. We made uh, tacos tonight. Yep, or it was sort of burritos, but yeah, it'd be tacos. Yeah, that's a that's a uh, that's a staple of ours because we can rip rip that meal off in fifteen minutes, like start to finish, as long as they don't have to thaw ground. Well, beef. to give you a perspective, we got back here at what six fifty. Six fifty. And by. 7:20, we were done eating. Eating, and we made and we made burritos with guacamole and yep. and whatever. So yep. you figure it out. And the meat was frozen. But meat was we frozen. Got there at 6:50. Yeah, we got here at 6:50, which is pretty nuts. Um, and I was able to get it done. But um, the way we split it up is like I'll cook dinners and Isaac will cook breakfasts. Mm -hmm. Um, and as part of our deal here, Greg supp Greg and Jan supplement our meat. 
our milk and our eggs. That's and what so, I was drinking. So we get three gallons of raw milk. It's gonna increase once Connor, our, our our new interns, coming at the end of the month. But we get three gallons of raw milk from the Amish, um, and we get four dozen, four dozen eggs. eggs a week from the Amish. And then we have a chest freezer directly to my right that's full of meat from the farm. And then th there is pork, even though we don't raise pork here, and that's from a uh, from like producers elsewhere that that jan and greg know and, and they there's chicken they buy a pig from the same amish yeah same amish family raises mm -hmm. the chicken the milk and the eggs um for us so it's a pretty pretty good deal we eat very well <laughs> just put that out there yes yeah what do you do to prevent the animals from eating the grass coming up in the spring flush when it is too young or early you... so that's where the stock pile comes in advantage like yep. right now there's grass growing but they're stockpiling there, so they can't take that new stuff down to the ground. They've got to eat through a lot of dry matter to get, to get there to get to it. So that's like that keeps them from eating it too early. And then ideally, we won't be to solely, you know, to to only new, new stuff yep. until we're done. Like you know, until this new stuff is big enough that it's like not plenty, plenty big enough. To, like yeah. ideally, we'll have enough stockpile to ration it out to that time. So. Yep. Uh, where do you sell your cull animals? Oh, uh, that's a good one. That is a good one. Yeah, somebody asked me about this. Like, how does what what is Greg's criteria for for like calling a cow to like get slaughtered? Which is sort of a like a, a misnomer as to how we get rid of culls. Um, the how we get rid of culls is usually through the sale barn. Um, so if we 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 went through and we labeled how many. 13 because right now is the time of year you want to be looking to call animals because not because like like looking to call them isn't you want to keep them around as long as they're not going to die you want to keep them around for the spring flush because you need more mouths to but eat you, all that grass you need to look at but you need to, to be exactly called. you need to look right now for who needs to be called because as steve steve campbell would say like they're in their work clothes right now mm -hmm. meaning they they at least here in Missouri, at this time in the year, they've gone the longest period of time on the lowest quality forage they'll ever encounter over the course of the year. And so their condition right now is as bad as it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Not saying that the condition's bad on the animals by any stretch, but it's as if bad. It is, if it is, it's going to happen now. It's going to happen now. Nobody's hiding behind like, like really good grass, basically. You know, like mm -hmm. you're going to see those animals and how they really perform when they're pushed. Mm -hmm. And so now is when you go through and you look for those animals that are getting thin on you and aren't performing. And those are the ones you need to mark down. And then after the spring flush, get rid of them because you need those mouths during the spring flush. But then afterwards, we sell them to the sale barn. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's a way of generating a little bit more cash flow from the, 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 the cow mob because, you know, it takes two, three years for an animal to become marketable, right? So like calf gets born, it's like, you know, two, three years until that, that, that calf turns into a heifer and gives you another calf, right? So that's a return on investment. And it's about two years until that bull becomes old enough where you're able to sell him. Um, so uh, at least that's the way that we run it. Um, like a year to two years, the bulls will be able to be sold. But anyway, yeah, so sale barn if if we were set up for it like if greg had a had a larger proportion of his of his um revenue generated from the from the cattle was through grass-fed beef you could use some of your like still pretty decent call animals you don't want to be trying to slaughter something that's just a rack of bones but mm -hmm. if you've got something that looks Has halfway decent it's got still some good meat on it like you could if you're set up to do it and you can get a slot you could go get that butchered and turned into ground beef and mm -hmm. you're gonna make a lot more money off of that than and you, you would at sale, sale barn. barn um but yeah sale barn is how we we get rid of our calls um yeah i'm yeah. not gonna say anymore because yeah. <laughs> yeah, i don't know what you were thinking yeah, yeah. i know i wasn't gonna say yeah that. uh does greg try and hold on to animals over the winter preparing for the flush um that's what, that's sort of what i was talking yeah, about like he's not gonna he's not gonna bring an animal through the winter just for the flush flush if it's like something that like steers like he won't bring steer only like two or three for our own consumption he's not going to bring you know a herd of 21 steers or whatever through the winter through the winter um but that being said like With the calls we keep the yeah. calls the bulls a lot of the bulls 
um, which those are bull calves from the last spring, so yeah. that's a little bit different. But, but yeah, but that's the sort of the deal. Is like if you're planning on getting rid of stuff, don't do it right before your grass is about to jump. Uh -huh. Like that's when you're gonna need them as long as they're gonna be okay. If you think they're gonna really go downhill between now and then, like obviously you gotta do what you gotta do. But if you're if you're having to feed a lot more hay just to try to keep these animals through to the spring flush, you need to you weigh can that do option. it. You can do it, but you got to understand that that's an input you're putting into your animals. You know, like you can put a little, you can put money into your animals because they're gonna give you a calf that's gonna bring you, you know, more money in the end. So yeah. it's like an, an investment, but there's like a there's a, a line that you don't want to go over because then it's like you're, you're cutting into your profit. You're feeding so. excessive. You're feeding excessive amounts of hay, and which means for not the like you're, the you're not getting the advantage. You just gotta crunch yeah. the numbers and figure out is it worth feeding that amount of additional hay for the return I'm getting for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's the thing is like, it's not a hobby. Like at least that's not what we're all about. Mm -hmm. Like some people- It can be a hobby. It can be a hobby and some people love it and they don't necessarily need it to make money for them. We're focused and I think a lot of you guys out there are also focused on like this being an actual business. And so yeah, at the end of the day, yeah. you've gotta be paying attention to money in, money out with, with this kind of stuff because you can get lost in the weeds pretty quickly and then you turn around and you have nothing to show for all of your effort. So. Cause that's the thing. It's like, you know, we all love what we're what, what like this, but in order to do what we love, we have to be able to survive doing this yeah. or live doing this. You yeah. know, like, and to, in order to live, we have to have enough money to be able to yeah. live. Like, yeah. it's like you know, you have to be able to make it work for you to to do it. So yeah, it can't it can't be costing you. It has to be making you making money. money if you want to do it full time. Yeah. Which, We'll just Which, leave it at that. We'll leave it at that, yeah. Uh, what trace minerals do we use, and does it change per region? Whew, that's a that's a question. That's a deep one. The reason why it's a deep one is, so everybody who's been following Greg for a long time knows that he uses Free Choice Enterprises as a mineral. Mm -hmm. We went to a seminar recently. Um, by It was put on by Steve Campbell, um, and he had a whole presentation for half a day about cattle nutrition. And we're in the process of testing out a completely different nutrition mineral supplementation plan um, because we were noticing that we might be having some mineral deficiencies using the free choice. Uh, nothing's conclusive at this point. And we're, yeah, we, we're just trying. We're it, just so. testing it out. But essentially, to make it super basic, what, what we're concentrating on is increasing the amount of good salt that's going into the animal um, in the form of like Kansas, this particular Kansas rock salt that's. Um, that used to be an ocean floor and it's it's highly unprocessed so there's a lot of residual um, sea minerals in the in the salt and so by increasing their intake using like by actually like making a brine out of the out of the salt by like dissolving water. it in water um, as well as like combining it with some apple cider vinegar we're trying to boost their salt intake which is going to help with a whole host of like issues that we might be seeing as far as mineral deficiencies and as well as like trying to make them a little more alkaline, which is going to help with with pathogens and diseases and pests and whatnot. So if people are super interested in going into like what we learned from Steve Campbell, we can we can go. We could also do it in another. But live that stream that's too. like that literally exactly that could be an entire topic yeah. of like what we're what we we're, we're learning. There, there was two parts to the whole talk yeah. too. We, each one each one of those could be topic. its own topic, but yeah. because the second piece was how to look at animals and look for phenotypic traits that are going to tell you stuff about their genetics and the way that like their offspring are going to perform down the road and how they're going to perform. Yeah, I still yeah. haven't looked at my notes yet from that. Yeah. I've been like just waiting to just like let it settle kind of settle, and then go back into it and really um, deep like understand but it. But that will be a top. I'm going to just say it right now. That will be a topic going forward is, is yeah. cattle, cattle nutrition and cattle um, like phenotypic selection of cattle will be, an, will be another another talk that we'll do but um yeah that's sort of like the thirty thousand foot view of what we're trying out right now and we have no conclusive evidence because we've started using it for about a week mm -hmm. and it's one of those things that's going to take months and months it may be long after we're Maybe gone years, to try to yeah. sort of see the full results of what's happening but nutrition is important you need to make sure that your cattle are getting the minerals they need and that does vary location to location so there's some areas that, you know, like the Mountain West has highly mineralized grass compared to here in mm -hmm. central Missouri or the eastern United States. Um, and so their mineral program out there is going to be vastly different from the mineral program that we need to use because 
like our mineral intake from the forage is extremely low in comparison to somewhere like out in Utah or Idaho or something like that. So yeah, um, that's a, it's, it's a good topic. It is a good topic. It was a really good talk. It was a super good talk. If anyone has an opportunity to go to a Steve Campbell seminar, hundred percent, a hundred percent recommend. Yep. All right. Can you talk about your shirt reject ranch manufacturing? It was that, is it, was that somebody or is that? Yeah. Okay. Cause sometimes Kendall or Amber will get on, will get no, on to one of these I don't think it, and no, ask, and ask for a shout out, which we're totally good to give. But, um, so reject ranch manufacturing is, are the, is the people that make the bail and roller, the Greg Judy bail and roller. They're in Ovaz, Missouri, um, and Kendall pipes and his wife, Amber, Amber, um, Amber handles a lot of the sales. So if you've ever bought a bail and roller from us recently, you most likely have probably been in contact with Amber at some point. Um, but Kendall makes the bail and rollers him. He has a shop and him and I think he's got a couple employees, um, yeah. and, and, uh, haulers and whatever. And they make them from scratch at his farm or ranch reject ranch in, uh, in Obaz, Missouri. So he gave us, the, he gave us this, the, yeah, yeah, these shirts. There's so, also, there's also a shirt that says, uh, this, this is how we unroll. Yeah, this is how and we unroll. It has unroll. a picture of the bail and roller on it. It's so cool. Yeah, they. But anyway, and go. They have an Instagram, so yeah, go give them a follow and see what's going on. What's what's? I don't think I follow. The it's Reject, Reject Ranch. Is it? Yeah. Maybe, actually, I do. Yeah. And then I follow. I think this I this too. logo is like their is their picture. So Kendall's a great guy. Awesome I've never guy. I haven't met Amber, but Kendall. Kendall's Kendall's great the guy. Man. Yeah. Um. By slowing them up, no. Something in, by speeding them up and slowing them down when grazing, that's basically the size of the paddocks. Small paddocks mean slow, large means fast. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yep. Man, we're like, this is like back from, <laughs> we're way up there. Maybe I should go down the bottom. No. I'd love to work out with the neighbor to have some of his cows on one field to strip graze in the spring uh, to keep on it while I have my sheep elsewhere keep it from being stemmy later for the sheep yeah so yep. getting the cattle in there to, to keep it vegetative would super be super helpful for you know for the nutrition yeah. of the sheep uh, how often does greg experiment with new ideas and concepts so we we did a we did a, a podcast with um freedom foods farm last Monday and that was posted like this weekend. Um, it's up on his channel on YouTube if you want to go check it out. He's also on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, Ryan is his name, I'm pretty sure. Um, and he uh, he asked me that like you know what's one thing that you've like what the what's the most important thing you've learned from oh, Greg? Yeah. And that was my thing that I most important thing that I learned from Greg is that like you should always be questioning like what you're doing and is it the best is it the best way to be doing something and so greg because greg is really good at that like he's always open to new ideas and new ways of thinking and maybe new ways of down to like splitting paddocks in a different way than he usually does mm -hmm. but like as big as like mineral programs for the cattle you know what i mean like he's not afraid to try something different because as he says like how do you how do you know like you're, yeah. you're never going to improve if you if you just keep doing the same thing right. so you got to be willing to like take some educated guesses and just try stuff out and see if it works and always be monitoring um what you're be monitoring what you're doing um so yeah yeah he, he's 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 super open to to new ideas and new concepts and stuff that we put out um stuff that he reads or sees or whatever there's um, definitely things that we've thought of coming on that we like talk to him and he's like oh that'd be a good way to do it and then yeah. we do it that way or something like yeah yeah, so it's, it's a strength. For yeah, sure. it is. It's, yeah. it's testament to his character. Yeah. All right. Another question. In a previous discussion, you guys mentioned that you like Galloways, but not the belted Galloways. Can you expand on your reason? I've answered this comment from two different people today on YouTube. Yeah. People, people commenting that, and it's a very simple answer. All it is is if you're selling any calls at a sale barn, 
you will be get docked significantly by selling belt galloways mm -hmm. just because they look funny. Mm -hmm. And so you're you're just leaving an unnecessary amount of money on the table doing that where you could be grazing galloways, which mm -hmm. are not belted and they'll do totally fine. They look fine. kind of similar to Angus they're, or Red they'll Angus. They'll do totally or... fine at the sale barn. So if it's not that we're knock, knocking, knocking the belted breed. galloway. They're actually, I think they're pretty, they're pretty good, good cattle. Good, yeah. Pretty good cattle. And people are into them. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're selling direct to market with all of your animals, like your butchering your yeah. calls you're selling grass-fed beef like you're not relying on sale barns at all which is a good way to go and for some people it raise as many belted galleys as you yeah. want because there's they're great cattle it's there's nothing against them it's just if you're using the sale barn you should just use a galloway so instead the, of a yeah. belted galloway so the problem with the sale barn is anything different gets docked yeah whether that's horns whether that's Belted Galloways, funny that's colors. Dexter's, funny colors, spots, like, Weird say you hair. have a batch yeah. of red cattle, there's not, there's 20 red cattle and one of them has a white spot on its side, the, the cattle buyer will sort that white one off and say he's different, and then he'll, you know, he'll pay this amount of money for these 19, and then this next white one will, with a white spot will come through the, 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 uh, whatever, the ring right after it, and he'll bid on that and get that cattle for a smaller price. And yeah. he's just doing it to be a good businessman. You know, he's doing it because he can to try to make his costs lower, you know, yep. but it's like you, the producer, the producer are just going to get, you know. Docked for no reason, yeah, basically. Yeah, it's like, it's, it could be the best heifer in the bunch, but yet, because it has a white spot on its hip, you know, it and, gets docked. And the reason why, because there, there is a Galloway and a belted Galloway, and mm -hmm. they're basically the same animal. And yeah. so it's the the color is just different. So if they're the same animal, like if the belted galley was its own thing and there was nothing else like it and it's really cold tolerant and like does super well in certain environments, like it might be worth that price doc. But when you have the exact same thing mm -hmm. that is just a different color and does a lot looks better like at a Oreo sale cookie. barn. They get people here. Yeah, if you want it looks like an Oreo cookie, people get all weird about it. Yeah. So um anyway. I think they're cool, but Yeah, I think they're cool too. It's just it's like just, that's the only that's, that's the what only we reason. say when we say we don't, don't like we, yeah, Belt Belt Galloway's. Galloway's. It's not because we don't like them. It's because of the... This, because of the whole sale barn thing. Uh, I have 180 acres needing electric fence perimeter. How long would it take you to run a single strand hot perimeter around this tract? And can I hire you off of from Greg to do the job on your vacation time? I don't think you can hire us on our vacation time to go and put in fence for you. But... Um, yeah. <laughs> but Depends you, on how much you're charging. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but... Um, uh, it, 180 not, acres. If you're doing a single strand, it, which, it, you're, is he doing a perimeter though? Yeah, right. If you're doing a perimeter, you need probably three to five wires. Especially if you're along a blacktop or even mm -hmm. a gravel road, it's ideal to have five, five wires, wires along road top. You could get away with with uh, with. It depends on your situation. situation. If you're in the middle of nowhere and you don't have cars, you don't have a lot of neighbors, you know. Yeah. That's you can get away with you know, three. the single even. Yeah, but the single your cattle need to be trained. Yeah, to the, that's to the wire to, for that to be a single we'll wire. We could do it probably. We probably in do a it day in a day or two. Um, we could probably do it in a day if it was full work. One hundred eighty acres. No, there's no way you could do it in a day. One hundred eighty acres. That's if it's a size. square. Yeah, it depends on the. It depends on the dimensions and how many corners there are. We could do it in a week for sure. Oh yeah, for sure. I I yeah. was thinking a couple of days yeah. max if you're just working on fence, mm -hmm. but. Um, if it's five wires you though, four that are available yeah, too, and, and you had the right, if, if you have all the right equipment, it would it wouldn't go it wouldn't take that long. But it's like mm -hmm. five wires just takes five times as long. As really, no, <laughs> not that long though, because once you get the post in, you just have to yeah, pull the extra wire. But it, but it takes it takes longer. longer. Every wire at least takes twice longer. as long. Probably. Yeah. Um, um, that's the advantage of understanding how to use high tensile though, because it goes quick once you know like the tricks, um, which that can be a whole other topic. <laughs> Yeah, fencing is fun. I enjoy building. Once fences. you learn it, yeah. once you learn how to do it, like it's it's definitely it's fun. work. Yeah, but it's enjoyable work for yeah. me personally. But the 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 clearing part and the scoping part of the fence is like that's the worst part of the whole deal. Yeah. Like actually getting to assemble it is is, kind is of pretty enjoyable. fun. I mean, driving posts is never no. super fun, but like you get a good workout, get a good workout, and get a nice pump. <laughs> do you ever struggle with grass tetany? During the spring flush, that's what we're, that's talking, what we're talking about. That's the, the mag term. Mag so mag your magnesium. magnesium, your magnesium is preventing your grass tetany, which is um, it can kill cattle. It can kill cattle. That's it's what, a, isn't it like just too? I don't I don't know what. My mom would know. I don't my, know. My, mom's, was my mom's a vet, so Greg had it happen one time, and by the time he got 
the vet over there. He saw the cow. She was frothing at the mouth, I think, and she was. And then she keeled over, and by the time the vet was here, she was gone. Yeah, it kills them very fast. Yeah. So. And there is something like if the vet can get there in time, I think there's something they can give them to prevent to, it or to you know to recover. It, you know, yeah. Help them recover. Yeah. Once they have it, but I don't really know um, much about it. The. That's also, when you're grazing yeah. really short. You're grazing a lot way, of way plant material, yeah. grazing it way too hard in that spring flush. They're just eating too much of that washy grass, um, not just taking those high energy tops. Yep. Make a video on what you learn for minerals, please. Yeah. We'll, yeah, we'll, we we'll, will. The more we learn, we'll keep We'll keep, we'll keep, we'll keep throwing it in there. That video might be a little ways down the road because we still got to figure some stuff out. Yeah. And another, I'd love to hear more about the Steve Campbell seminar. We'll, yep. we'll talk about, we'll talk that, about that, that later. We'll talk about that too. Uh, please repeat the podcast you were in. Oh, it's uh, Freedom, Freedom, Freedom Foods, Foods Farm. Farm. He's got a YouTube channel. I think that's his primary deal is his YouTube. Um, and he's got an Instagram as well. But if you want to watch the podcast, it's on it's on Freedom Foods Farm it's on YouTube. YouTube. Just look up. Free, you might even be able to look up our names our and, names find, and it. find it. But um, Freedom Foods Farm. Yeah, Ryan. He did a good job. He did. Really yeah. good. He's a good guy, too. Yeah. Had we'll a good, a good podcast. You, if you guys are interested, in, you know, if you're entertained by us here, yeah. it's pretty much the same thing, but it's like he's asking some really good questions and, you know, yeah. similar to this. And so it's, it's another, yep. know, go, go watch it. Yeah. I, I recommend it. Talk about some good things there. Um, do you think that Angus or Low Line is in line, is in line with Greg's low weight cattle so they don't destroy your pasture from sheer weight? Wait. You just all, in regardless of what breed you're looking at, you want to make sure that ideally they're maturing, the cows are maturing at that 1,100 pound mark. Or not, if you go smaller, yeah, you know, that's even better. It's even better. The only deal though is if you get below, I would say like 900 pounds, 800 at, max, eight, like at a, at, a, at a sale barn, when you're oh, getting yeah, significantly yeah, lower than like 900 pounds, you're going to start to see some serious docks because yep. like, you know, guys who are buying them for feedlots or other th like they don't want animals that are that small mm -hmm. um so that's all big thing, so but but again if you're all direct to market you know what i mean not relying on sale barns they're super efficient on grass because oh, yes. they're smaller low lines and dexters are extremely efficient yeah like like you said if, if you have the market for it and you can sell all grass-fed beef you don't have to sell the sale barn at all you can go low lines. Low lines are dexterous. They do have, yeah. I don't know, and we were talking about this, I think last week even. Yep, yeah, we talked about it last week. Um, I don't know, like, the cut of, cut ability, whether it's, like, I'm sure I'm sure it's pretty similar, you know? Yep. Like, whatever percent of of the car, of the hanging weight is actually, it's the carcass, yeah, like, is actually a what product he, you, you can sell. Yeah. But I'm sure it's, you know, it's probably going to be smaller stakes, you're going to have different things like that, but. As far as efficiency on grass, yep. they're extremely, extremely you got to think about it like this, like it takes, so like say a thousand pound cow compared to a 500 pound low line, yep. it takes half as much food to keep her going through the winter, you know, and still raising a calf, yep. you know, so it's like, you yeah. can run a lot more. Yep. Um, Profit per acre. Yeah. What you'd be focused on. Yep. All right. I have a four or five strand barbed wire perimeter already in place. Oh, gotcha. So, so just that. running an offset. The single hot strand goes on the yeah. inside. Yeah. The offset would not take very long to do. Rec so what people are, if people are. Yeah, are rectangle, 2.3 mile perimeter. We could, we you know, could we do, could do that in, in, a day, in, day, in a day. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's not hard to do. So like the, what, what he's talking about is an offset hot wire where he's already got a perimeter fence mm -hmm. being a good perimeter fence being made of barbed wire. Strand barbed wire. There's no reason to tear that up to put in a hot wire. So you basically use the two together. You use the perimeter barrier as mm -hmm. the barbed wire and the hot wire on the inside because there's a number of reasons you want to do it. But A, you add a psychological element to the barrier because you're talking about electricity now. So like the cattle are like afraid of it as opposed to like, oh, I just can't get through that. There's like this, this psychological barrier, like that thing's gonna eat me up if I try to go over there and, 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 and try to mm -hmm. negotiate the fence. But the big advantage though of doing that is now you've got power hookups around you, the entire perimeter of that piece. So you can start running your interior divisions without having to worry about where you're powering up. Um, you just always have power like everywhere, which 
I mean, is, is just a massive advantage. That's how we run the farm here is there's like, what is it, four chargers on the, over five, the, five chargers over the course of the whole property. And those chargers power miles of fence. And so that's how we, they're basically the fences are acting as transmission lines as well as fences at the same time. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's a pretty cool setup. And those chargers are all plugged in. They're not solar chargers. Not saying that there's certain situations where solar chargers could work, but if you're talking about like perimeter fence, you want you're, you want like like a beefy charger, and that thing needs to be plugged into an outlet. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah. Do you prefer purebred or crossbred crossbreed when breeding? Uh, Greg's you know is all all purebred South Pole. It's sort a line, of. It's line. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's he's been line breeding for what twenty years now. Yep. By line breeding, we mean keeping all his own bulls, you know, and breeding back to his own heifers, and so. Yeah. It's kind of a closed system. There is definitely some hybrid vigor that, ha but you got to think about South Pole. South Pole is a, is a cross between Red Angus, Hereford, Barzona, and and uh, Senapole. And so that's you you're getting some hybrid vigor from that, you know, the cross of the four crosses. That being said though, my stance on the whole thing is like you should be more focused mm -hmm. on an animal that performs in your environment than what the genetic makeup yeah. of that animal actually is. Mm -hmm. So if taking a South Pole and crossing it with a Corriente is going to make a better animal for your environment, you should do that. Mm -hmm. If a South Pole, the reason I keep, we keep like pushing South Poles is because they're so, they do so well on grass. They're bred for grass. They're yeah. grass genetic speed or yeah breed. breed like they're they're bred to do well on grass um but it or so if you take a like self pole and with a galloway you know like maybe that'd be super good for cold environments or a like self pole with a highlander i don't know you know what i mean like there's there it's a really interesting concept of being able to cross and make a unique hybrid that works better for the environment that you've got um mm -hmm. the only things to just keep in mind are you want animals that are gonna max mature weight of twelve hundred pounds, and um, and will like fit your environment in order to augment the stretch the range of the South Pole because the South Pole is really designed. It's developed in Alabama, and it's really designed for hot, humid summers. And it can get cold in the winters, but not for extended periods of time. And by cold, we mean like sub zero temps or in the single digits, teens, mm -hmm. for like long periods of time, months at a time. If you're in that camp, or you're in a camp that's hotter than like 80s, 90s, and high humidity in the summer, like New Mexico, Mexico, like the city, like the desert southwest, if you're somewhere like that, um, you're going to want to consider crossing in something that's going to stretch the the um the comfort zone of of like the south pole so yeah always be focused on an animal that's going to give you a calf and excel in your environment yeah if that's you if you important. focus on that as opposed to genetics genetics or people get super when we say genetics we're talking about like specific lineage of this bull to this cow to you know yeah like, like certified like south pole certified like registered yeah cattle registered or cattle like or whatever we're not in that camp no <laughs> some people love it and if you love it power to you but for a production model, I mean, there's there's some advantage of like, oh, you can sell it for more money because it's registered. But if you work on your marketing enough, you could sell something for the same price and have an easier time raising it potentially. So anyway, that's like a whole rant. But So every, yeah, so everybody that we were talking about Freedom Foods Farms, they just joined and commented. So go click yeah. on there if you want to go see the yeah. podcast we did. Um, yeah. It's a good podcast. Go check it out. It's definitely worth the watch. Yep. So, did a good job on it. Yep. Can you get uh, deep? Wait, what? I, my phone has a piece of dirt. <laughs> I can, wonder why. Can you get good deals on smaller frame animals at the sale barn? You want to always be careful of buying animals from a sale barn because there's a reason they're at the sale barn. Yeah. Like a no, lot of people send their coals to the sale, to the sale barn. barn. So you just be wary of that. You could be bringing something on that's. Foot snotty rot or... as foot rot te bad temperament um yonis yonis some sort of disease like mm -hmm. it, you just have to be super careful buying stuff from the sale barn it may be cheap but you might pay for it mm -hmm. pay for what you get 
if you have the money, buy the highest quality stuff that you can. And buy private treaty if you can. Because yep. you're not, you know, when you go into the sale barn, those cattle are stressed. You know, you're putting a lot of stress on your animals. If you can buy, if you can buy private treaty and, you know, go to the farm, pick up the cattle and bring them home, it's a lot less stress on the animals. You're going to lose, they're, they're not going to lose as much weight. They're not going to get sick if you're buying, you know, that transition stockers. will be easier. Um, it's just, and plus then you're supporting, you're directly supporting a producer, you know, that's selling animals as opposed to, not that sale barns aren't important and I'm not saying yeah you shouldn't support sale barns business, but yeah. I don't know. It's yeah. If it was up to, if it was up would, to us, you'd go rather. buy from somebody like Greg. Mm -hmm. Not saying that you have to buy from us, but like, yeah. you know, somebody who's doing stuff. And that's important too, to like touch on as well. Like if you've got somebody like closer location wise to where you're at and they're raising some good stuff, don't just buy like Greg stuff from Missouri. If you live in Tennessee, because it's Greg, even though like there's some guy raising South, Pole. South poles, like down the road from you and they look really good. Like that is who you should buy from mm -hmm. because they're going to be the, the transition from like down the road to your yeah. farm is going to be minimum compared to, you know, hundreds of miles from your farm. Like the cattle are going to get adjusted and not saying that they won't do well because they probably will. But like buy local when it comes to if you can buy quality local stuff, that's the ultimate. That's the ultimate. If you can't buy quality local stuff, then buy quality. Yep. And if you can't buy quality... You need, to, you need to look harder. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or something. I don't know. What time of year do you breed? I'm reading a book and it says to breed with nature to reduce predators. Um, so there's a whole host of reasons why. You're right. Like we like to sort of align our, like, align our calving with like when everything else, like when the deer are, are, are dropping their fawns on the ground. Like we like to sort of align with, with, with that kind of a deal. And it's for a number of reasons. Predators we don't really have to worry about predators with a mob that big and we don't have we to don't have the predators we don't have the predators would... that would deal with that would take out like a full grown cow um yeah. and with the sheep we've got guard dogs up the you know what <laughs> i mean like we have more guard dogs than than we should than we should um so there's nothing messing with the sheep um which which is i mean the sheep are way more vulnerable than the cattle are um but we try to lamb and calve right when that grass is really kicking because the mothers, once the calves start to grow in like a couple of weeks after they're born, like really start to like put on the weight, that plane of nutrition for those mothers is at its highest when their demands for lactation are at their highest. So the calf is getting all it needs, the mother's getting all she needs. It's just a great situation to be in. Um, yeah, and for us, that's calving starting April 1st, lambing starting May 1st. Mm -hmm. All right, last question because we gotta go to bed. Yeah, we, we, we have, have, a, we have like a, twenty minutes over. So that's... we have a long, we have a long day tomorrow. We're going on a cons consultation mission to Southern Missouri. Yep. Gonna go look at some bison. Bison farm should be interesting. We'll talk about it next week. Can I line breed and have a closed herd with only thirty breeding cows? Well, so Greg would yeah. recommend what? So um, what? What we would we would recommend is. You don't want to be keeping your bulls to breed, you know, to breed back. So the, 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 the definition of inbreeding is when a bull calf breeds his mother. When a, a bull breeds his daughters or granddaughters or great-granddaughters, that's not inbreeding. That's, that's line breeding. breeding. So with, with the situation of 30 cows, you don't have enough size to then be keeping back, you know, one bull to to breed your thirty cows because he's inevitably gonna breed his mother, and you're gonna you know be inbreeding. And so, what Greg would recommend, and what we would recommend too, yeah. is if you if you purchase a bull, you know, from a different producer, you know, different genetics, and you bring him onto your farm, he's a really good bull. He did just really well. He performs. Your first calf crop is you looking know beautiful good. calves. Yeah. They're, they're looking really good. Keep back those daughters of those first calf crop, and you can breed that bull back to his daughters, and you can breed that bull back to his granddaughters, and and you know use that bull until down. the tires fall off. Yeah, and then and then maybe look at getting another bull, you know. And if and if you're looking at keeping your herd size around right, 30, thirty, then you just keep you know the generation repeating. going down, and then you just keep buying in new bulls. If you can get up above fifty head, 
then you can start to kind of think about, you know, maybe keeping back a bull and or a bull or two, probably two bulls in that situation, um, and breeding, breeding, uh, starting breeding your breed cows that way because then there's less of a chance that he's gonna breed his mother. And then when you're talking two hundred or whatever, one hundred sixty cow breeding breeding animals, it's even you know it's even less, less of a chance. Likely. So and there may be an instance where a bull breeds his mother, and you may have some Dick weird animals. genetic yeah animal. Um, we had a bull calf yeah, last yeah. year. We called him ugly. ugly. He looked like a little shaggy buffalo calf. Yeah. And uh, we ended up selling him to the sale barn. Who knows? Who knows, if, yeah. who knows if that was inbreeding, inbreeding or if it's just it's just part of fluke. breeding. You know, part of the cycles of nature. Yeah. Um, Not everything turns out to be a stunner, even on Greg's farm. So. So. Um, yeah, just I just make sure that wait thirty is too small to really be really be line breeding. You want to get above fifty is like the short version. But buy a good quality bull and use that dude until the wheels fall off, um, and then and then buy another bull. You don't need to be purchasing new bulls every single year. It like especially in the beginning when you don't have a lot of capital. Um, find a good a good bull and just use them and use them and use them and use them. So mm-hmm. um, I mean like Greg's genetics, his bulls, they're proven to last. He's got this one bull that's still in use and he's like eight years old. Still doing nine, his, nine. Still doing his deal. Oh, so big nuts, big nuts. Um, he's he's doing well. So with that, thank you guys. That was a that was an awesome live stream. Um, a lot of great great questions. Uh, we didn't get to everything. We we almost did. I mean, there's one question we didn't get to. So oh, that's, look at that. That's, so that's we, pretty. We, we were well ba- I mean, we were caught up when I said we were gonna as the last we, question. Awesome. So. Yeah, we, um, we we did it. We, we did we it. We tackled the mountain. Um, so these these live streams happen every Sunday night. Um, I will post this episode along with the relevant clips onto YouTube at some point this week. It'll probably be mid to late week. Um, and I'm trying to get better at that turnaround time, but we don't have internet, so mm-hmm. you know, it takes a little while. Um, so that'll be posted onto YouTube every Sunday night around seven thirty. We do this um, new topic questions every week um if we're a little late it's because we were making tacos and we and we, and we were or we had a late night of chores and we didn't yeah we didn't. and sometimes if i know we're going to be late i'll throw out a, an updated uh countdown and be like hey we're going to be 30 minutes late or it's going to be at eight o'clock instead of seven thirty or whatever but um, or maybe it'll be a six thirty because we got something going on but barring a catastrophe sunday evenings we'll be here if mm-hmm. you'll be here so thanks everybody we'll see you all next week